Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Astronomy Off Tap Edinburgh. Uh, it's lovely to see you all. Um, so my name is John, uh, and uh, everybody's very welcome to our, our new YouTube event. Obviously, as, as most, a lot of you know, our usual place uh, is in the pub. And unfortunately, due to uh, this uh, pandemic that I think a lot of you have heard about, uh, we are currently not able to do our usual activities. So we are live on YouTube bringing you talks as per usual uh, via the, the magic of the internet. Um, so for anybody who's not joined in one of our events before, welcome. Uh, for anybody who's been with us uh, before and is joining us again, welcome back. Um, so Astronomy on Tap is a free event run by volunteers and features accessible, engaging science presentations on topics ranging from planets to black holes to galaxies to the beginning of the universe. Um, the first uh, AOT event took place in New York a few years back and has since spread all over the globe and there are many sort of satellite events happening everywhere of which we are one. Um, so as you said unfortunately this is our, our, our sixth off tap event which is I think our 20, 22nd or 23rd overall um, so we've been doing it for quite a long time. Uh, if you're interested in uh, following our future events please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Um, Tonight, we're very lucky to have three great presenters who are gonna be enlightening us on a whole range of fantastic topics from phosphine on Venus, uh, to ultra cool white dwarves, to the possibilities of life in our galaxy. So uh, we've got a really great lineup. So we're really happy you can join us. Um, so if you are watching us uh, on YouTube, please feel free to ask questions of our speakers. We'll have a space at the end of each talk for you to, to put your questions to our speakers. Um, so please stick them on YouTube or put them on Twitter or sort of send them sort of via sort of satellite through the air and we'll probably pick them up by carrier pigeon out the window. Um, if anybody is interested in future talks or has a great idea for a topic or knows a brilliant speaker, we're always interested. So please do drop us a line, stick us a note, send us a message on Twitter or Facebook. We're always looking for new ideas. So just please do let us know. Uh, and so we let's let's get started. So. We're going to start off uh, this evening with a bit of an update um, from our, our, our regular rocket man, Fred, who's going to give us a bit of an update of what's happening with some rocket launches uh, this month. So I'm going to hand over to Fred and he's going to let you know a little bit more about that. Over to you, Fred. Hi, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, all right, can you see that okay? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. So welcome to uh, November 2020 cool rocket launches. Um, uh, I'm the next screen. But I think we see your, um, the, not the presenter view, but the other view. It's the edit mode. All right. So. Better. Uh, sorry, no, we don't see a shared screen yet. I think if you reshare your screen, Fred, and then it'll come up again. And don't if it comes up in presenter mode, that's okay. Okay. Better? Yeah, I think that looks okay. All right, cool. Sorry about that. All right, so I was going to talk about um, stuff happening in the solar system, but uh, there's too many clouds, so we're going to miss everything, like the Leonid meteor showers and a few other cool things. But uh, I thought the rocket launches this month happening are much cooler. So here's a quick summary of everything that's happening this month. A couple of things have already happened. Um, but yeah, so the first one is a Indian rocket that, hold on. Oh. Yeah, an Indian rocket that's going to be launching an Indian radar imaging reconnaissance satellite uh, built by the Indian Space 
people. And it's a very, very cool launcher as well, because uh, they've launched uh, the missions down the bottom, um, the Moon mission, uh, the Orbiter, and India's first uh, Mars mission as well. Pretty cool. Right, next up is uh, China's NUSAT, um, which is a commercial satellite for Argentinians, and it's being launched on the Long March 6 rocket, which is the kind of light um, weight satellite launcher. Um, they've had three launches before this. In fact, it's all already passed, uh, and all of them were successful. Uh, next up is, oh no, this is the new sat one, uh, but it's being launched on the Falcon 9, which is pretty awesome. Uh, it's going to be on November 10th. Um, yeah, as everybody knows, the Falcon 9 is partly reusable two-stage rocket uh, that can land on barges. Uh, and then on November 13th, there's Spain's uh, CEO satellites. Um, so it's a wide field imagery satellite for uh, geospatial imaging. Um, that's been launched on uh, um, Arian Space Vega, which is uh, another cool one that's done a lot of cool launches. And then November 14th, there's uh, the first crewed Dragon capsule being launched by uh, a Falcon 9 by SpaceX. And that's going to be launching uh, Michael Hopkins, Victor Glover, and Shannon Walker. Oh, and uh, Soichi Noguchi, the from Japan, so it will be uh, going to ISS. Um, after that, on November 24th, there is Russia's Angara A5 rocket, which is actually a test, and this is a re replacement booster for the Soyuz. Um, so that's going to be, that's for Soyuz missions. Um, that's going to be taking place at a new launch facility in the east of uh, the Russian Federation. And then, just to wrap things up, here is a cool size comparison of different rockets. Uh, these heights are in meters. Um, so Saturn V is still the record holder at 111 meters. Thank you. Okay, Fred, thank you very much indeed for our, our starting of the event with our introduction to rocket launches. Um, fantastic. So we're going to move on now to our, our first speaker of the night, uh, which is going to be Dr. Dave Clements. So uh, I'll just give you a quick quick introduction uh, to Dave. So Dr. Dave Clements is a reader in astrophysics at Imperial College London. Uh, he's worked on the Herschel and Planck space missions, was the UK project science for the Speaker Project, Spiker Project. Oh, you can correct my acronym pronunciation, Dave. Speaker general is what we call it. <laughs> there you go. See, I'm, I'm clearly a bad speaker because I can't pronounce speaker. Uh, and has used many large ground-based telescopes in the, in the JCMT, UKRT, ESODLT and others. Uh, most of his work has concerned distant dusty galaxies, but he's now turning the techniques used for studying molecules in the distant universe to looking for signs of life in our own solar system. So, Dave, I shall hand over to you. The floor is yours. Okay, many thanks. Let me get my screen going. And hopefully this will work. Does that work? Yeah, that looks great, Dave. Great. So um, <clears throat> what I'm going to be talking about is the discovery of phosphine gas in the cloud decks of Venus. Um, I'm one of the people who's on the paper, but uh, it's, it's a large number of people who we can call the Venus phosphine team. And you'll meet more of those in a little bit. Before I start, though, uh, I need to acknowledge that ob uh, observations for this was partly made at the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, which is built on Mauna Kea, uh, which is a land that belongs to the indigenous Hawaiian people. Um, and we need to acknowledge that they, this land was um, acquired under threat of violence by the US. And the fact that Hawaii is such a wonderful place to do astronomy and to visit today is largely because of, of their native Hawaiians knowledge and care for these unique islands. So, uh, right, and this is the phosphine team uh, with Professor Jane Greaves from Cardiff University indicated as our glorious leader. So that just introduces you to all of the people who've contributed to this work. This is gonna be how most people came across this result with uh, quite a flurry of uh, press coverage. It's an interesting result. Um, and whilst we are not claiming any definitive signal that there's, there's life on Venus, as you'll see as, we, as I go on with this talk, uh, it's an interesting 
potential indication that something something mysterious is going on in Venus, whether it's life or something else uh, we can get onto later. So how did I get into this? Um, I'm an extragalactic astronomer most of the time. Um, but while I was working on the Herschel Space Observatory, uh, I got talking to uh, Jane Greaves and others like uh, Helen Fraser uh, about what the Herschel Space Observatory would be able to do uh, within our own solar system, um, possibly looking for uh, signs of biological activity. What I was most interested in at that point was looking at the plumes of water vapor coming out of Enceladus, which is a moon of Saturn. And whilst we didn't actually get any Herschel observations of that, we did get some observations of these water plumes from ground-based telescopes like the JCMT and the IRAM 30 meter, which allowed us to discover the presence of methanol in these plumes. Sadly, it turns out that that's not a um, marker of some, something going on beneath the icy surface of Enceladus. It's actually a result of ultraviolet light uh, driving photochemistry in the material that's in these plumes. Uh, and so the subtitle of our paper on this was, when is a biomarker not a biomarker? Time moves on. I became involved in the Speaker Project, which is a follow-on to the Herschel Space Observatory. Um, and at a meeting in the RAS, I challenged Professor Greaves to come up with interesting things to do with Speaker within our own solar system. And as well as a number of ideas about looking at icy objects in the outer solar system, Jane came up with the idea that you could use Speaker to look for phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. Now, phosphine had been seen in the atmospheres of gas giants where it is chemically favored, but on a rocky planet, in the atmosphere of a rocket planet, it shouldn't be there in any, any significant quantities. And if it is there, it's a sign of something unusual going on. Sadly, uh, speaker A, even if it flew, would never be able to observe Venus because there's a cryogenic telescope, needs to be cooled to very low temperatures. You can't point it towards the sun. And even more sadly, uh, the European Space Agency unceremoniously killed speaker about uh, two months ago, which was very sad for those of us who've been working on, on it for quite a long time. Nevertheless, uh, Jane realized that you can also look for phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus from the ground using the James Clark Maxwell telescope, because there is a rotational transition, a particular um, excited state of phosphine that has a transition that produces an absorption line at a wavelength of 1.123 millimeters, which is conveniently where the atmosphere is reasonably transparent. So we can do that from the JCMT, and it's already known that the JCMT can set limits of a few parts per billion on the presence of certain gases in the atmosphere of Venus. An example of that is shown at the bottom here, where this is a, a non-detection of a line. So these observations um, used the receiver A, which is an instrument that's been on the JCMT for pretty much since it started op operations about 30 years ago. Um, and this is a picture of, of, of the, the, the little receiver A over here. Um, Venus presents some unique problems for observations because unusually for an astronomy project, it's actually too bright. So the data is actually quite complicated to process. Um, and we had to do some fairly cunning things to get to the sensitivities we needed to be able to see what was going on with the phosphine. But after a lot of work to remove complex and varying baselines, which I can show some more later if you're very interested, we came up with the result that phosphine was present in the atmosphere of Venus. Um, you can see here, depending on, on different ways of removing these confusing baselines, the, we, we can get slightly varying different strengths of this absorption line, but it's there no matter what you really try to do. And implies that there's about 20 parts per billion, 20 parts per billion of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. The, our, our best bet is to, to the line shape shown here in black uh, and a model in red of what 20 parts per billion of phosphine would do is shown over the top of it here, which matches quite well. And to be honest, when we did these observations, we didn't expect to find any phosphine at all. So this was quite a surprise. 
The first thing you do after that is you try and get independent confirmation of this with other observations. So we applied for time on the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ALMA, which is a much bigger and more sensitive instrument. Uh, it's got, well, we used, it's 46 12 meter dishes, whereas the JCMT is one 15 meter dish. So lots, lots more collecting area. And because it's an interferometer, we get to see things at a much finer resolution. But again, the data is complicated because Venus is too bright, it's too big. And because we're looking for a, a small dip on a very, very bright uh, background, we actually had to push ALMA to its, its sensitivity for these sorts of line, one to two orders of magnitude more sensitive than its original specification for being able to do these kinds of observations. And with the considerable help from lots of experts at the ALMA Observatory, we were able to do this. And we got a confirmation from ALMA. So in, in red, you can see the spectrum we got from ALMA. In yellow is the spectrum we got from JCMT. And in the background here, you can see the image of uh, the, well, surface, the atmosphere of Venus taken by the Akatsuki probe, which is a Japanese space mission currently in orbit around uh, Venus, which has shown this, this anomalous ultraviolet absorption, which you can see in sort of muddy gray here. Um, which we don't have an explanation for at the moment. So we found phosphine, but where is it in terms of the atmosphere? And the altitude that we're detecting phosphine at is an altitude of about 55 kilometers above the surface. That's important because this is a region of the atmosphere of Venus where the temperatures are not too different from the from, um, surface temperature of the Earth. And the atmospheric pressure is not too different from surface atmospheric pressure on the Earth. Um, and so it's a place which has been suggested by people like Lewis Dartnell that this is a, a niche in the environment of atmosphere where biological processes might be possible. We also, thanks to the ALMA data, are able to say something about where phosphine is in terms of where it is on the planet. Um, so we divided our ALMA data up into three different regions. We, we added the polar regions, north and south together, and found that there's no, not, no sign of phosphine in the poles. We added the mid latitudes together and found a nice big phosphine absorption line. So that's where most of the phosphine is. And then we looked at a strip across the equator and found marginal evidence for phosphine. So it seems that phosphine is most present, most abundant in the mid latitudes. That's significant because it's in these mid latitudes where the Hadley circulation cells mean that material spends most of its time in this temperate layer before it is pulled, sucked back down to the harsher lower altitudes of the atmosphere of Venus. At the poles, there's, there's a polar vortex, which means there's circulation to the lower altitudes quite rapidly. And at the, at the equator, it's, material is, it's dominated by material rising from these harsher lower altitudes. So if there is going to be anything that's biological going on, which needs the kind of temperatures that we're used to here on Earth, and which are, are predominant in the 55 kilometer, kilometer altitude clouds, then it's these mid latitudes where it would be most likely to be happening. So this is just a brief summary of the observational results. We find phosphine at about 20 parts per billion um, amounts at, out, at the heights in the atmosphere of Venus where you have Earth-like Earth temperatures and Earth-like pressures. Uh, there's reduced amounts of, of phosphine at the poles. And roughly speaking, the amount of phosphine that's seen is consistent between when we did the JCMT observations in 2017 and when we did the ALMA observations in 2019. Where does this come from? Known abiotic processes fall short on being able to produce this amount of phosphine by a factor of about 10,000. The main reason for this is that the chemical pathway to producing phosphine goes through very slow, very um, 
energetically disfavored routes to this synthesis. And we also looked at how the sun's light can drive photochemical processes to produce phosphine, how um, volcanoes from the surface of Venus might be able to do it, how lightning might be able to do it. And we even looked to see um, whether injection of material from infalling asteroids or cometary material might be able to produce this level of phosphine. This was done by uh, Dr. William Baines, who's written an enormous paper, about 99 pages, looking at all these possibilities and all of them fall short by at least a factor of 10,000. So what makes phosphine? What makes phosphine here on the earth? There's two processes, two, two things that make phosphine on the earth. Uh, industrial processes where we humans make it to, for, for, for chemical engineering purposes. Um, but it's also found associated with pond slime, uh, anaerobic bacteria in pond slime, in the intestines of certain mammals, such as badgers, uh, and in piles of penguin guano produced by Gen 2 penguins. That's this little chap here skating over the ice floes because penguins are much prettier than piles of penguin guano. And these things are not usually associated with astronomy. But we mustn't forget that Venus is an incredibly hostile place. Famously, it's been described by Carl Sagan as hell. It's subject to a runaway greenhouse effect, which means that the surface temperatures are high enough to be able to melt lead. And the surface atmospheric pressure is 90 times the surface atmospheric pressure of the Earth at sea level. It's also highly acidic. There's a huge amount of sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. And if you, all of this adds up to mean that if you are lucky enough to be able to get a space probe to land on the surface of Venus, they're lucky if they survive more than a few minutes. Some have. Here's a couple of uh, holiday snapshots from the surface of Venus from uh, two Venera probes, which were launched by Russia in the, in the 1980s. And as you can see, it's, it's not, uh, not the kind of place you'd want to go and spend your holidays, uh, even if you could cope with the heat and the atmosphere. But whilst the ground level is deadly, the, you've got this temperate zone in the cloud decks where biological activity might take place but the cloud decks are still incredibly hostile. The, there are droplets in these, the, the, these clouds, but they are 10% water and 90% acid. So they are so acid that you, they're, they're, they're thousands of times more acidic than the most acidic place we have naturally occurring on the earth. It's also 50 times drier than the driest place on the earth. And the driest place on the earth incidentally is the Atacama Desert where Alma is based, which is kind of appropriate. But you can imagine, or at least our biologists on the team, um, I'm, I'm not a chemist myself, can envisage pathways for producing phosphine by biological action in this environment. Quite why you would want to produce phosphine in this environment is unclear, but we've seen it, so it's got to be produced by something. But biology here would still need to survive an incredibly hostile environment, be protected from the 90% acid in these droplets. And you can, in principle, do that with things that resist acid, like wax or graphite or, or even silicon as, as a way to do this. And uh, one of our collaborators, uh, Professor Sarah Seeger, has even gone so far as to come up with a, a possible life cycle uh, for organisms that live in these droplets. And, and there's a reference to the paper here, uh, which you can go and have a look at. Um, and these organisms have to go into a, um, a spore-like dormant state to survive being circulated into the, more, the harsher parts of the atmosphere of Venus, or, or in fact, in, into the also not particularly um, conducive to life upper levels where there's uh, low atmospheric pressure and ultraviolet from the sun. So lots and lots of people have been looking at our results. There has been some criticism of what we've done, uh, which we think we can answer. Um, one of the more interesting things that have come out is possible independent confirmation of the presence of phosphine in, in this, these altitudes in the atmosphere of Venus 
from the Pioneer Venus probe, uh, which dropped um, a descent stage into the atmosphere of Venus in 1978, and which had a mass spectrometer, which seems to indicate the possible presence of phosphine uh, in those clouds. It's not something they looked at originally, nobody expected phosphine to be there, but there does seem to be a signal that suggests something with the molecular mass of phosphine was spotted. What next? Obviously we're going to be doing more ground-based observations to confirm what we've seen, to find out where the phosphine is and look at how the amount of phosphine might change with time. To really understand what's going on though, we need in situ observations. And at the moment we have Akatsuki in place. It can't directly observe phosphine, but it can do other observations. Uh, the Bepi Colombo mission, which has got a mid infrared spectrometer, which in principle might be able to detect phosphine, flew by uh, just a few weeks ago. It's also going to fly by again at a closer altitude um, in a bit over a year's time. And the JUICE space mission on its way to Jupiter's icy moons, it, which and has a submillimeter spectrometer, which will be able to detect phosphine directly, um, is going to fly by after it launches in a, in a couple of years time. What we really need though are new Venus missions and some are already being studied by ESA and NASA. Envision, uh, an ESA uh, candidate mission is designed to study the surface and lacks what's really needed to look at the clouds of Venus. So that doesn't really help. Um, most interesting of the major space agency missions is NASA's Da Vinci Plus mission, which would have a descent module which would go through the clouds and would be able to do much, much better than the Pioneer Venus uh, probe did. Um, whereas Veritas, which is another NASA mission, would essentially be doing similar things to Envision and is not aimed at the clouds. And we also have a, a Rocket Lab, Breakthrough Rocket Lab, uh, which has been planning some small, small satellite missions to Venus, and they may be able to launch something fairly quickly. And that will be very exciting to see. So that's where we are. We've detected what appears to be phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, which was a shock. We were only expecting useful upper limits. Um, it's difficult to explain how it's there through normal chemical processes. Um, and it's now been well, getting on for a couple of months and there's been no real um, progress in, in the world chemistry community coming up with ways that the phosphine could be there for it through uh, normal or even somewhat abnormal chemical processes. Um, data's being looked at by other groups. Uh, I don't think we've found any showstoppers yet but explaining the presence of phosphine with life is still a very, very big challenge. And what we really need is, is more detailed study of the clouds of Venus. So that's it from me. Um, I look forward to hearing some of your questions. And should I stop sharing the screen at this point? Yeah, that's great, Dave. Thanks very much. Okay, stop share. That was pretty awesome. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Dave, for so much for, for that detailed presentation. It's a really, really interesting topic. And we've got We've got a few questions from the audience, if that's okay with you. Yep, go ahead. Okay, so um, our first question uh, we had was, if phosphine, if this is produced by life in the atmosphere, is there any chance that it was contamination from Earth? Not contamination from what we've sent there. Uh, space probes have gone to Venus so recently that um, you wouldn't be able to populate the, the clouds of Venus um, in you know, less than 20 years to the level that would be required to produce this. Um, and especially if that detection of phosphine in 1978 was correct, then you know, there hadn't been any landers there at that point. So it's not us as people that may have contaminated it. Um, it is the case that if a large asteroid hits the Earth, some of the material from that will get blown into, well, out, out of, get, get escape velocity and be blown off the surface of the Earth to orbit the solar system. And some of those rocks may, have, may end up landing on Venus. Um, we've certainly seen that effect with rocks 
knocked off Mars by asteroids landing on the Earth. So that is a possibility. Um, and if there was something living um, in that rock that's been knocked off the Earth by an asteroid, and if if Venus, as look as seems to be the case, um, was a rather more hospitable place uh, in the mists of history, maybe a billion years ago or more, then something from the Earth could have established itself on Venus. And then when runaway volcanic activity turned Venus uh, very hostile, evolution would have taken that life forms uh, up into the atmosphere. We won't know whether this is the case until somebody can strap one of, uh, assuming that there is life in the clouds of Venus, and that is still a big assumption. If we can take one of those organisms, literally strap it down in a lab and look at its how it works. If, if it's found that it, it's got similar cellular chemistry to what we see on the earth, so it runs on DNA and RNA and has the same genetic code, et cetera, et cetera, then that would be prima facie evidence that there is a common ancestor between us. It's gonna be a long time before we can do that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, our second question is, there will obviously be some recent doubts cast on the data and it seems like your research has gone on a lot longer than this disputing paper, but what's the position of the project team on this? Well, we're just about to submit a very large uh, response to uh, some of this criticism. Um, I can go into examples of what's been suggested that we may have gone wrong and why we haven't, and I've got some slides prepared on that if you're interested. Um, that may take longer than we have time for. <laughs> What I will say is, I, I, I can show, show, show some snapshots. Let me just tr try and find some here. Yeah, okay, so I'll share the screen again, if I may. Yeah, go for it. Uh, find the right button. Oh, where's the screen showing? There it is. We always, we always keen for exclusives, Dave, so yeah, go, go ahead. Okay, this is actually in our original paper. Um, ah, okay. Strangely enough, the people who have been criticizing seem to have ignored some of this. So one of the criticisms is that we have to fit a fairly complicated function to remove the baselines that we are getting because Venus is so bright and it sets up um, standing waves and reflections, et cetera, in, in the instruments. Now, it's been argued that when you do this, you produce fake lines. And it may be that the phosphine line we're seeing is fake because of this process. Now there's two ways of checking that. One of which is to look, uh, pick another part of the spectrum where we don't see a line, treat that part of the spectrum as if there is a line there and see if we make a fake line. So that's what's done down here. Uh, we, the, in blue, this is what happens when you apply our data reduction process to where phosphine is. Key thing here is we know what the wavelength phosphine has, so we know where it is. And then in red is shown what, ha what, what happens when we apply our data reduction process to places where there isn't a line expected. And as you can see, there is no line produced. So on that basis, we think we're okay. The other way of, of checking this is to look at the data before we've done this final polynomial baseline subtraction, as it's called. And what's shown up here is the non-polynomial subtracted data in green from the JCMT and in purple. So green, this, this thing bouncing around here, looking really horrible, is the JCMT data. And this purple bit here bouncing around a bit less, uh, but still rather unpleasantly, is the data from ALMA. Now, if there were a lot of places here where there were dips in both at the same place, then you might say that there are fake lines that are coming through here that might be mim mimicking phosphine. The only place, in fact, in this where there is a dip in both the ALMA data and in the JCMT data is here at zero velocity centered right on the wavelength of phosphine. 
So on that basis, we think the data analysis is correct. There's also been a suggestion by um, a team uh, led by Villanueva um, that we've mistaken phosphine for sulfur dioxide. And it's true that sulfur dioxide does have uh, an absorption line not too far from where phosphine is. In fact, you can, you can kind of see it here. In green is what you would see uh, from uh, sulfur dioxide, whereas red is our, is our data. Um, so it's actually offset. So the positions are wrong. On that basis, we don't think we've got a contamination with, we, we haven't mistaken sulfur dioxide for phosphine. But also there's another phosphine line, which we were able to tune a different part of the ALMA um, spectrum to. Uh, so we can see, is there a lot of sulfur dioxide? Is there so much that we might, it might be producing a big enough absorption that we'd get problems with our phosphine interpretation? And that's what's shown here. This is the, in, in, in dark black here, this is where that other sulfur dioxide line would be if it was detected. And as you can see, there is no sign of it whatsoever. Um, and in red, the solid red line is what we would need to see in the sulfur dioxide line if the phosphine was entirely as a result of that sulfur dioxide, which isn't there anyway, so it can't be. So hopefully that um, explains some of the things. Um, that, that's just going on talking about chemical reactions. So I'll stop sharing my screen at that point. But that is a good question. And we really do want people to go and look at our data and try and find out if we've got something wrong, because that's really the way you do science. Right? You've got to check, double check, put your data out there for other people to look at, to mess with, and to make sure that what you've done is right. And we think we've survived the check so far. Fantastic, thank you, Dave. As, as you said, we're running a little bit behind. There are a couple of other questions, but we have a, put them up on YouTube. So if you are able to sort of sticking around and answering some questions on there, maybe you can sort of type a few answers out, but that was a really brilliant talk. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us. It's been a Thanks great response. Thank, thank you. Now celebrate by having a bit of you. Cheers. We're off tap or we can be on tap too. Thank you, Dave. Absolutely. Okay, cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, now is the point of the evening where we are gonna have a very quick break uh, to hand over to our resident games master, Amy. So I'm gonna pass across the baton to you, Amy, uh, and I'll let you go. All right, hi everybody. Um, I feel like I'm, um, yeah, kind of not worthy of our ultimate games master, John, who normally runs them in our live events. Um, so I'll try to do, carry on your name the best I can. Um, so I shall share my screen. All right, so no apologies here. I have basically gone and just blatantly ripped off a game as that's part of um, BBC's Richard Osman's House of Games. If you have not watched this game show, I highly recommend it. It's super addictive. It's completely ridiculous. It's exactly what AOT needs. Um, so basically the premise of this is I will put up a clue on the screen that obviously has an answer to it. So it's a bit of a quiz question, a bit of a slightly cryptic clue. Um, but not only do you have to think of what the answer is, but the physical word of the answer is hidden within the clue. So you also have to try and find where in the written clue you can see the answer. So we have an example here, which is a non-astronomy example. Um, don't be like one of our team who spent an inordinate amount of time trying to find an astronomy word in this example that didn't exist. Um, so we have this vehicle carries a family on a road trip. So, you know, so what could that be? Um, obviously something with wheels. OK, so you think car, car, you know, a car is a vehicle that carries a family when you go somewhere. Great. Where is that hidden in the clue? Have a little think, have a little look. And then I'll reveal where the location is of the answer. So hopefully that makes sense. So the next six questions will be um, astronomy based and we will have 30 seconds to give you to have a look and come up with your answer. So you can have a chat with your family or your friends that are with you or have a chat on our YouTube chat screen as well and um, see if you can get them. All right, so 30 seconds. This planet takes a turn playing with funky rings. 
have they got planets? What does rings mean as well? And I realise that music's going to make zero sense to anybody not living in the UK. <laughs> but for those of you who are, hopefully you appreciate that. So the answer for this one, Saturn. So Saturn has rings and there's obviously a planet in our solar system. And that's where you find it in the written clue. OK, so hopefully this makes a little bit more sense for you if you didn't get it before. Number two, Roman gods need a premium arsenal to reach this planet. Did you get this one? Mars, okay, so Mars is the Roman god of war. So many of our planets are named after um, Greek or Roman gods. And this is where Mars is hidden within our clue, premium arsenal. All right, number three, this ball of dirty ice may become tapered. Have a go. clues guys comets okay so comets also known as dirty snowballs and this is where we are in the answer as the tail when it's melting from the comet obviously you know, like sort of moves towards a tapered shape all right number four this object provides a demo on how to act like a satellite this might need a little bit more thinking Okay, so hopefully this one hasn't thrown you too much. The answer is moon. Um, so we call the moon our natural satellite as it orbits the Earth the way that a man-made you know, TV or a telescopic satellite might do. Okay, and that's where it is within our answer. Demo on. Penultimate question. Okay, so I think this one's probably the trickiest out of the six. A renovation of the night sky occurs when a white dwarf becomes too greedy. So you might need a little bit more astro astronomical knowledge for this one. But have a go. And the answer for this one is Nova. Okay, so a Nova occurs when a white dwarf steals a lot of material from a companion star and it creates this explosion. So you can see it kind of renovates the night skies. It makes this extra beautiful cloud of gas. Okay, and the final one, it's been said that this large moon has liquid water on the surface. Orbit it and see. Oopsie daisy. Am 
my clock is not going to work, but luckily our countdown theme is 30 seconds exactly. final answer is Titan okay one of the moons of Saturn so it's the only one that we think has liquid surface water um somewhere like Enceladus you might have heard of that has it's suspected it has water but it tends to be underneath a surface of ice so Titan's the only one where we think it's actually on the surface itself okay and there it is within our answer all right so that's our six questions so let us know in the YouTube comments how many points that you got at the end of that one and I will pass you back over to John. Thanks so much Amy. I can say with certainty that that was way better um, than the usual fare that I bring along and clearly showed, <laughs> <laughs> clearly showed your superior games master skills because I got two uh, and the rest of the time I just got confused and started googling stuff so there you go you win. <laughs> Um, fantastic. Thanks so much, Amy. That's brilliant. Yeah, as Amy said, please do post your score uh, in the YouTube chat. Let us know how you got on uh, and then uh, we will move on to our next fantastic talk. So our next speaker tonight is going to be Professor Brad Gibson, uh, who is an Aussie Canadian transplant and the head of uh, physics and maths and director of the EA Milne Centre for Astrophysics at the University of Hull. Uh, so Dr. Gibson gained some a degree of notoriety by defining the Milky Way's galactic habitable zone. Uh, which was named a top 10 news story of the year by National Geographic, uh, determining the expansion rate of the universe, for which their team was awarded the Gruber Prize in Cosmology, and building the first wor world's first liquid mirror telescope observatory. Uh, Brad's 300 plus outreach events over the last four years have reached nearly a million people around the world, including more than 50 schools and colleges around the UK. So we're very, very lucky to have you, Brad. Please welcome to AOT Edinburgh, and I shall pass it over to you. Oh, I think you're on mute, Brad. Oops, forgot to hit that button. Sorry about that. You think after doing about a million of these over the last few months, I would have uh, clued in. Apologies for that. Uh, thanks very much, uh, very much for having me. Um, it's a double honor to be sort of sandwiched between David and Anna. I mean, uh, I can look back to when David and I were young and fresh faced and we were together in Oxford way back in the day. And it's great to see him again. And uh, with Anna coming up next, uh, Anna is doing her PhD in Vancouver where I did my, my PhD. So even though um, I've not had a chance to work with either of them, I do have this strong connection to them, it feels like. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and sandwiched between the two of them. So my background is more in um, galaxy formation, galaxy evolution, using simulations to figure out how things like the Milky Way form and evolve, how the chemical elements get synthesized inside of stars and pushed around the interstellar medium and incorporated into the next generation of stars, et cetera. So that's my background. Um, about 15 years ago, I started to think, well, what else could I use my simulations for? What else could I extract from them besides sort of just the generic physics about galaxies? And it took me down this road of thinking about where in the galaxy are the, the building blocks for life, maybe not dissimilar to the building blocks uh, to life that we have in our solar system, looking at the various chemical elements and the various ratios. And since I can distribute those self-consistently around simulated galaxies, I can then walk around inside of a simulation and see where else are the basic building blocks similar. And that got me thinking a little bit about the origins of life and how common it might be. Um, I'm not an expert in slightest in biology or real chemistry or geology, um, but I play one on these sort of talks. So uh, bear with me as I go through uh, looking at this topic about hunting for aliens. And I, I like to think that I'm not alone in sort of moving beyond my comfort area a little bit into looking at the sort of question about hunting for aliens and, 
and asking the, these sorts of questions. You know, I like to, you know, I can align myself with Stephen Hawking, who one of his quotes, you can see there at the bottom, there's no bigger question in science than the search for extraterrestrial life. So even Stephen himself, despite you might think of him as a hardcore mathematician related to, to black holes and, and alternate universes and wormholes and all the, the other things that come with that. Um, but certainly in the, in the latter years of his life, he put, you know, his, his money where the mouth was with part, working with uh, Mark Zuckerberg and others in the establishment of the Breakthrough Initiatives Program. And so uh, I, I feel like part of me is at least in, I've got a, a kindred spirit there. So it's not entirely crazy if Stephen Hawking himself thinks that this was a, a fundamental question. So this is the fundamental question, are we alone? I'm not gonna answer this question um, as much as I would like to be able to. And if we were all sitting together in a room, I do a very quick straw poll and I would probably find somewhere between 90 and 100% of you would put up your hands and say, no, we're, we're not alone. There's gotta be something out there. And if I asked you the question, how many of you think there is complex, advanced, intelligent, but however you may sort of define that life out there, you know, a few of you might put your hands down, but you probably still have two thirds, three quarters of you would still have your hands up saying, no, there, there probably is complex life out there. Uh, if you ask the, ge the general public um, polls that have been done, it's something like around 60% believe there is something, something out there. And this is probably a biased sample of people who've, who've tuned in tonight to hear talks about astronomy and astrophysics. So that's why the number would be a little bit higher. Uh, so what I'm going to do is look at some of the astrophysical things that um, make this question a little bit tricky to answer. Because, I mean, obviously, we, you go out into the night sky, you look up in a dark site, you may see five, 6,000 stars. And already that's sort of overwhelming. And... You know, if you take a telescope and do deep images and start counting the number of stars that are out there, you know, within our galaxy, you may have 100 billion stars. And it's very easy to, without even thinking about the science of it at all, to just conclude, look, there's so many stars out there. There's got to be something out there. And, you know, I grew up as a full-fledged science fiction fan, as, as your previous speaker, Dave Clemens, was, as, is as well. And so it's, you know, it's built into our genetics in some sense that we, we, we want to feel that there, there is something out there. So let's just look at some of these astrophysical things that might make this question a little bit trickier to answer and, and perhaps even trickier to come down with a positive response that there is something else out there. And so, you know, one of the common questions I get if I'm sitting on a plane and someone leans over and looks at my, uh, my laptop, uh, or depending on the audience I'm giving a talk to, they'll say, well, yeah, of course there is, you know, I've seen UFOs, I know there's something out there, there's got to be life out there. And a common one is this, look, there's got to be life on Mars. I gave a, a talk a few hours ago to a primary school, a group of year fives. And one of the first questions that come out is, is about life on Mars. Is there something there? Is there something there? Um, I've heard read somewhere that there is life on Mars. And, you know, you don't have to Google uh, too much to, to discover all kinds of fantastic photos of things on the surface of Mars that, um, you know, if, you, if you're here in the UK, every few months, you might get a headline story in the Daily Mail that says, ah, look, we've discovered life on Mars. And here's some examples of the things you might see. You know, there's a, the, the two pictures at the top there, looks like a, uh, a woman sitting on the, the edge of a ravine, sort of resting her arm on her, on her knee. Uh, down at the bottom left, you'd be looking at, you know, what looks to be like a frog on the surface. You've got a floating spoon that's sitting there. Um, you've got what looks to be an iguana. You've got a rat. The one that I like the most is the one that looks like somebody's left behind a bowler hat sitting on the surface. Now, are those evidence of aliens and life on Mars? Well, there's no scale in those pictures. Each of them are probably, you know, of the scale of you know, centimeter or so. These are tiny little rocks that are sitting there. So I don't think, you know, I can probably put hand on heart and say these really aren't evidence that there is life on Mars anymore that if you wander through the Sahara Desert here on Earth and take a picture of this amazing thing, which is a, a rock in the Sahara, whoops, uh, which is a, looks, you know, to all intents and purposes as a, a hedgehog. It's not a hedgehog, uh, no matter what it looks like. Um, but it just shows, you know, this is kind of this psychological thing, the way you look at a cloud and you may see a train or a plane or a bunny or something like that. It's pareidolia, the way your mind is able to twist things. And depending on the viewing angle, it makes it look like, like something else. So while they're super cool and they're really interesting, um, and there's a massive database of, of both rocks on Earth and rocks on Mars uh, showing pictures of things that look like something else, they really aren't any evidence of, of, of any extraterrestrial life. Um, 
And you could give an entire talk on the history of these sorts of things, uh, the you know UFOs, the Nazca lines, the pyramids, the Iron Pillar of Delhi, lots of things. All of them are really interesting. If you're into sort of pseudoscience, fantastic study. None of them are evidence of, of aliens. So I'm not going to spend any more time sort of defending those or breaking them down uh, from my skeptical perspective. Let's just move on and, and look a little bit more about this question, of, uh, are we alone? And the first thing I'm gonna do in an astrophysical sense is I'm gonna step outside of the Milky Way and if you like, play God for a second and look down on our galaxy from above. And it looks like this, a prototypical grand design spiral. There's a bar of stars cutting across it. There's a supermassive black hole in the center and you've got these beautiful spiral arms coming off of the, the ends of the bars. Uh, there's about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. They're all moving in this, in this plot, all moving sort of clockwise, more or less going in nice circular orbits around the Milky Way. And they're all moving at roughly the same speed, about half a million miles per hour. Uh, we sit sort of in the suburbs, sort of halfway out from the disk. Uh, we live in, a, in an area where there's not a whole lot around us. We're nestled between these two spiral arms that you can see, which is where most of the action is where the young stars are, are, are found, where stars are being born, where the gas, the dust, the, the fuel for star formation exists. So most of the action is in the spiral arms. And we live in this sedate, quiet region where there's not much around us. And that's probably one of the first pieces of the puzzle for the development of at least sort of complex life in the sense that there is, there is really nothing around to, to bother us. So that's one thing to take from, from that. We're all moving at roughly the same speed and the spiral arms where we're sitting are moving at roughly the same speed. So we're more or less buffered from anything getting near us. So that gives us a, a degree of stability. Now, so we're talking about life and is there, is there life out there? So the, the typical analogy that not just me, but many use is a cooking analogy. What is life? Well, you need the basic ingredients, the building blocks for life. You need an oven to cook those ingredients and you need sufficient time to, to cook things. I'm not going to spend much time on the latter one. Cooking time, um, you know, we only have what one biosphere that we know about where life exists and that's here. And, you know, it took maybe a billion years for that, that first life to, to appear. And it took, you know, multiple billions of years before you started to get to complex multicellular life and sort of the advanced, you know, mammals are the only last couple hundred million years, homo sapiens the last couple hundred thousand years. So you need time and it doesn't just spontaneously appear. And there's lots of reasons for that. You know, the, the earth is not a particularly hospitable place in the first billion years. Things are pummeling it, all kinds of stuff are going on. And they've mentioned some of those things, you know, running into the earth, you know, there, it was much more common in the, in the early stages. It, you know, took a billion years, a few billion years before we developed a proper atmosphere, which helps to protect uh, any life, at least on the surface of the earth from, from develop, developing. So uh, I'm not gonna say much about cooking time. I'm just gonna say a few words about the ingredients in the oven. So what are the ingredients for life? Now, again, there's a massive field of astrobiology that, look at, that looks at this subject. And we do have a bit of a carbon bias. We're, we're a carbon based life form as most everything here on earth is. There is some logical physical, chemical, and biological reasons why we think carbon is fundamental, at least for the development of complex life. Again, whatever, however you define that. Um, largely because carbon is this magical, beautiful molecule um, atom that is really, really friendly. It's the friendliest of all the atoms. You can stick almost anything on carbon and grow complex molecules. You know, organic molecules, which are the fundamental basis for life, uh, are, are all based around carbon, you know, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, they all love to stick to carbon. So if you want complex life, you need complex molecules and carbon is unique. You can't do this with silicon. You start sticking oxygen onto silicon, what happens? It turns into rock. Um, so it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not impossible to develop life using other fundamental building blocks, but carbon is thought to be one of the fundamental important ones, at least for the development of, of complex life. The other ingredient which is thought probably to be important is, is water. Water is this fantastic medium in the sense that, you know, even that first life, that, that single cell that's trying to develop, it's like us. It needs to eat. It also needs to go to the toilet. And water is great. It's a, a fantastic solvent. So if you're trying to extract energy from an environment, it's great. Uh, it's also a fantastic medium for carrying waste material out of that cell. Um, now, you, again, 
there's lots of literature out there on doing this with other liquids. We've heard some mention about Titan, uh, maybe methane, um, but life around other liquids like that would be very difficult. You know, water is also one of the only liquids that is when you freeze it, it becomes less dense. So it freezes from the top. You take an ice cube, you drop it into a glass of water. It doesn't sink. It sits at the top because it's less dense. So if you are a life form trying to develop in a, you know, particularly in a hostile environment in the early stages where things are all kinds of things are going on, you have wild climactic changes. If your planet goes through a long period where it freezes, it freezes from the top, leaving all the liquid water underneath, much like you would see say on um, Europa or Enceladus, which freezes from the top, but is all liquid water underneath. So again, there are some logical reasons. It's not just simply a water and a carbon bias. There are some logical reasons why we do think carbon and water probably important for the development of complex life. Um, the other thing you need is an oven and the right sort of oven. So that means you need at the right temperature and you need some protection from things around you. Now, um, you know, liquid water, you know, it's liquid between zero and 100 degrees centigrade. And so you, if you've got a really, really hot star, if you're too close to it, you boil everything off. If it's a really hot star or a really big star, you need to be far enough away so that you're in the right, that sweet spot, the Goldilocks zone, where it's not too hot, it's not too cold, liquid water can exist on the surface. If it's a smaller, cooler star, then that Goldilocks zone is much, much closer and you have to be, you know, really butted up against the, the star before you're in the, the sweet spot. So in our solar system, you know, there's one, star, one planet that sits in that sweet spot, and that's obviously the planet Earth, right in the middle of the habitable zone, the Goldilocks zone, where liquid water can exist on the surface. Mars is just outside, probably in the past, you know, billions of years ago, it was probably just inside the habitable zone. There probably was liquid water on the surface of Mars way back in the day. So there's the kind of this, you know, rough rule of thumb. It's, you know, the, the data is still pretty sparse, but let's just say you might get one planet per solar system that sits in the, the sweet spot. And the data that is coming together now with Kepler uh, from NASA is pointing in sort of towards that sort of direction. Um, so that's one thing to bear in mind. Um, the other thing we think is important about the oven, not just the temperature for liquid water to exist, but protection. Now, Earth is great. It's a magnet, it's a gigantic bar magnet. It's got a North Pole, it's got a South Magnetic Pole. It causes, you know, Aurora Borealis, Aurora Australis, which is great, it's beautiful. But more importantly, it protects us from really high energy cosmic rays that could otherwise damage us, and particularly any surface life that's trying to develop as those complex molecules, those nascent beginnings of life are trying to come together. If you didn't have the atmosphere, it's a very hostile, nasty environment. It'd be very difficult for life to develop, at least on the surface, if we didn't have that atmosphere. And the reason we have that atmosphere largely is because we have this magnetic field which basically protects us from these damaging cosmic rays that would otherwise knock the atmosphere off. And that's largely thought to be the main reason why Mars doesn't have an atmos atmosphere because it doesn't have a magnetic field. And so its atmosphere has been evaporated over time by being pummeled with cosmic rays. Now, as well, Venus doesn't have a magnetic field. Now it does have an atmosphere, as Dave was just talking about, um, but it, it's it's a special one. It's, it's an induced magnetic field by the way the mag... Um, the sun interacts with the, the atmosphere of Mars that induces a magnetic field. So it's a bit of a special case. So we don't know enough yet about the magnetic fields around the thousands of other exoplanets that are out there, but you know, maybe it's one in 10, maybe it's one in three. We don't really know. We don't really know. We look at our solar system and you know, half of the rocky planets have got magnetic fields. So we do think that they're important in, in terms of protecting us and, and providing us with stability for the development of an atmosphere. We also have this really big moon. Now there are bigger moons in the solar system, but relative to the host planet, you know, Titan is bigger, but you know, you look around Jupiter or you look around Saturn, uh, you know, relatively speaking, they're inconsequential. Our moon is about one one hundredth the size of the mass of the planet Earth. The other 200 no moons that we know about are nothing. They weigh, they're a factor of a thousand or 10,000 smaller relative to their host planet. So we have this really, really big moon, which is really, really special. It helps keep us stable. We have, you know, we are tilted by 23 degrees away from the sun as we move around the sun and we stay stable at that for eons and eons and eons and eons because we've got this big heavy moon around us that keeps us stable. So that moon helps contribute to long-term climate stability, which may be important. It may not be fundamental for the development of life, but it may be you know, a piece of the puzzle. And it makes the Earth different than all the other planets we know about right now. 
The other thing which is special about our solar system in some sense is we've got Jupiter. It's this gigantic planet. It's a Hoover. It's a protective shield that hoovers up some of the incoming comets that come flying into the inner part of the solar system. Uh, this is just from what, 25 years ago when Shoemaker-Levy crashed, uh, plowed into the, the atmosphere, the surface, if you like, of, of Jupiter. And we caught, you know, they're, they're not fabulous movies, but you can see the breakup of this comet, which is about a mile or so in size. It's not sort of the 10 to 50 mile size comets that are the ones that are species killers, but it's still really, really big. And, you know, many, many orders of magnitude bigger than whatever impacted at Tunguska or the Chelyabinsk uh, meteorite from seven years ago in Russia. So it's a, it is a protective shield, a big gravitational shield that protects us from being hit as regularly as we would be hit otherwise. And why is that? Uh, I'll come back to that one in just a second. The other thing, and the reason why I'm talking about these things and the point I want you to take from it is that everything I've described thus far sort of suggests we're a little bit special. And that's, if you think that life is common and ubiquitous and it's everywhere, what you don't want is too many things that make you special adding up together or multiplying together. And each one of them by themselves is not particularly critical. But you start, you know, I've gone through about a half a dozen already that makes us a little bit special and a little bit special and a little bit special. What we know about exoplanets right now, we know what 5,000 or so exoplanets right now, maybe a thousand different exoplanet solar systems that are out there. Again, it's, it's early days, relatively speaking, but what we have right now in hand right now is that other solar systems don't look like ours. Ours is different. The masses of our planets, the way they are distributed is different than all the other solar systems that we know about. Um, and that is, you know, it, it's interesting, but it's, it's significantly different from the ones we know about now. Um, and also, you know, the, ex the planets that we know about right now are all much, 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 much closer to their host stars. Now, again, this is probably maybe a good part of it is a selection effect from the way Kepler has found all these planets. This is something which will become clear over the next decade with the next generation satellites. But it's, again, a little bit worrying that our solar system, the way the planets are distributed and the masses of them right now look very different from other solar systems. And again, if you, want, if you think life is common and it's out there in large numbers, these are not the sorts of things that you want to hear, that there's something special about us. And the reason why I, I say this, and I, just a couple things to finish up on, is that as I started with this point, we're moving at about half a million miles per hour in a nice circular orbit as we go around the Milky Way, and we're moving at roughly the same speed as the spiral arms. We're not moving at exactly the same speed, but pretty close, and this is called co-rotation because we're moving at the same speed, roughly. If we were a bit closer, the spiral arms would wash over us much more regularly. If we were a bit further out, similarly, we would get hit by the spiral arms more regularly. Now, not a whole lot happens to us when we get hit by the spiral arms, particularly our solar system down in where we sit is fine, but we're surrounded by something called the Oort cloud, tri billions, possibly trillions of comets surrounding our solar system, loosely held on by gravity. And so anything that can shake the solar system doesn't really bother the planets way down in the inner part, but it has the ability to affect things in the outer part. And I mentioned there's 100 billion stars are all mostly moving around half a million miles per hour around the galaxy. There's one star, it's an 11th magnitude star, so it's a bit too faint to see with the naked eye. It's called Gliese 710. It's a little bit different than all the other stars that you can see with the naked eye in that it is moving. It's like the barrel of a gun pointed right at our solar system. It's about 60 light years away. It's moving straight towards us at 30,000 miles per hour. And so in about 1 million years, which is small in the grand scheme of things, it will actually pass through this cloud of comets that surround our solar system. Again, it's not going to come, it's going to be other than the sun, the brightest thing in the sky. And so it's not going to run into the planets, but it is a force of gravity as it moves through the Oort cloud, shaking up these comets, some of which will fly away. But the best guess is probably about 10 million comets will come raining down to the inner part of the solar system. Now the solar system is mostly empty, so most of those comets will miss us. But every once in a while, one does hit us. You know, it happened, what, 65 million years ago, a really big one hit us took out 90% of the species that existed on Earth at the time. Now, we're still here, so it didn't kill all life. But obviously, you didn't, if you're doing an interview with the dinosaurs, they would say these things are a bad thing because they do happen. And it's on a long time scale. But this is going to happen in a million years time from now. Now, probably we'll have, you know, some disembodied head of Bruce Willis will be there who will fly up and deflect all of these comments before they actually hit us. 
But if anything is going to wipe us out in an astrophysical sense, it's going to be this event in a million years time that shakes loose these tens of millions of comets. If you're an amateur astronomer who likes looking at stars or galaxies, it's probably not going to be a good time to be around because the sky is going to be covered. It's going to be a naked eye comet appearing every month for about a million years or so. So it's going to be spectacular if you like your comets. Not so good if you like looking at other things. And the last thing I want to say scientifically is not only um, do we have to worry about as we pass through the spiral arms, we do get we do get a shake. The spiral arms wash over us and they shake us and they do shake loose comets in the same way that this star that passes through our solar system in a million years do. But as we go through those spiral arms, this is where young stars are born. This is and perhaps you'll hear something about that with uh, in, in Anna's talk. Um, and so when star, you know, the big, when big stars form, they live fast, they die young, they explode as, as supernova. Now, supernova is like a nuclear weapon. If it explodes on the other side of the Earth, it doesn't bother us here, where we're sitting in the UK. But if you happen to be near it, you know, it's bad for you. And a supernova is the same way. If it explodes on the other side of the Milky Way, it doesn't bother us. If it's too close to you, it can wipe out your biosphere. And so there's a lot of debate right now as to how close you can be to a supernova before it obl obliterates your biosphere. Best guess right now is it's around 30 light years or so. If you're that close to it, the shock wave and the energetics of this supernova remnant as it washes over you is enough to push deep down into your atmosphere and wipe out any life that exists. Now, up in the corner, you can see planet Earth. That's about 100 light years away from the supernova remnant. And this is what happened about 10 million years ago. We were far enough away from the lethal kill zone of the supernova that it didn't wipe us out. But we were uncomfortably close when it happened and it left a tiny little layer of a radioactive isotope of iron, it's called iron 60, thin layer of it covering the earth. The only place it's created is inside a supernova and we know the half-life, the radioactive decay of it. So we know exactly when it happened. We don't, we can't point to a remnant in the sky and say that was the one that did it. But again, it's one of these things that, you know, on, on 10 million year time scale, 100 million year time scale, you have to worry about comets hitting you. But you kind of also have to keep in mind these sorts of events of shockwaves blasting over you because these things do happen. So, and what this means is that thinking about our galaxy again, you don't want to be too close to the galactic center because that's where most of the young stars are forming right now. So there's supernova going off all over the place. So if you're looking for stability and long-term complex, the development of complex biological life, you don't want to be too close because you're going to get irradiated with intense radiation that's going to break apart complex molecules and proteins before they ever have a chance to actually develop into something. So now I'm going to pull it all together now in the summary. So we start off, there's about 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. Okay, but here's where the butt starts. Now, probably about one in 10 of the right sort of stars. You don't want big stars because they live fast, they die young, they explode in, you know, tens of millions of years and they're gone. Probably the ones that are really, really low mass, like one tenth as heavy as the sun, they're nasty because their habitable zone is butted right up against, you know, almost touching the surface. And you have to worry about, uh, uh, you know, flares, um, chromospheric um, ejections that, that impact on you. You get blasted with radiation and you're so, even though you're in a habitable zone for liquid water to exist, you are so close that you do have to worry about the development of life. It's probably not a great location. So probably around a fact, you know, within a factor of two of the sun is where you want to be. So maybe one in 10 stars are the right sort of stars. This is consistent with some things that have come out from NASA in the last, in the last month or so. Um, probably about one in 10 are in the right place in the galaxy. What do I mean by that? You don't want to be too close because not only do you get pummeled by spiral arms regularly, you've got stars exploding all the time. You've got too many supernova around. Where we are is a special place in the galaxy, this co-rotation where we're moving at almost the same speed of the spiral arms. So that's probably the right location. Um, our best guess is, you know, you can argue about the numbers a little bit, but maybe half of the stars out there have planets. So we're, you know, I've gone from 100 billion, I've taken one in 10, then I've taken another one in 10, then I've cut them in half. Best guess is right now, okay, it's based on really one, you know, one sample of our solar system. But over the last few weeks, NASA has put out some numbers as well that are very much consistent with this. Roughly one in 10 will probably have a rocky planet in the habitable zone. Um, this is a wild guess, maybe one in 10 have a magnetic field to allow the establishment of a long-term uh, atmosphere. Um, if you think it's important, maybe one in 10 have a really heavy stabilizing moon to stop your planet rolling around like a bowling ball as it goes around the, the sun. And so you started off with hundred billion stars and that takes you down to sort of a half a million, which is, you know, that's still a, a good number, um, but it's not a, you know, it's not a hundred billion. It's a, it's a lot smaller. 
So that's, you know, there's some optimistic numbers. If you were a little bit more pessimistic on some of those numbers, you can probably get down to on the order of 500 or 1,000 or so potential advanced civilizations out there. So that, you, you know, it's maybe a, a less bewildering a number than when you start throwing out hundreds of billions of stars out there. And then the depressing thing, and it comes back maybe to things called the Drake equ equation is how long does an actual advanced civilization live for? That's the, the killer in, in all of this thing. We've been around in an advanced stage of the ability to communicate for maybe a hundred years or so with, with radio. And we've nearly managed to wipe ourselves out on more than one occasion. So if you work out, you know, if each advanced civilization gets past this hundred years and say each advanced civilization lives 20,000 years using these sorts of numbers, how many advanced alien life you know, civilizations are out there if they live for 20,000 years? And the answer is one. That's it. Um, it's a little bit depressing. Um, it is maybe abusing a little bit the Drake equation. But um, it's trying to just be maybe a little bit more sobering about some of the numbers. And I still, at the end of the day, you know, I, I do really want to believe that there is something out there. And, I, you know, I put hand on heart and I, I think that there is something out there. Whether it's complex, advanced, alien life, I'm probably a little bit skeptical about that and probably will, ne will never see it in my lifetime. I do am hopeful that there is some sort of, a, you, know, you know, bacterial something out there. Um, I think if we can discover that somehow, then I would feel a lot com more comfortable about saying there's definitely something out there. But I think as Dave Clement said in his talk, finding life maybe on Venus or, you know, in underground puddles under the South Pole of Mars or underneath the ice surface of Europa and Enceladus isn't quite enough because all of our solar system formed from the same material. And there's been impacts that, you know, big impacts on Mars that have sent rocks over here. And there's been big impacts on earth that have sent rocks to Venus and to Mars. And so there has been some spread of material around. So necessarily, you know, finding something on Venus or Mars, it would be super exciting and, you know, approaching to me, Nobel prize winning science um, doesn't necessarily mean that there's life outside of our solar system because of that shared history in some sense. Uh, so that's everything I want to say. Maybe it's a little bit depressing, but hopefully you picked up a few things you hadn't thought of before. So thank you. Thanks so much, Brad. That was that was really, really interesting. I think when you started that talk, I think I was definitely a yes. Uh, and then I've been sort of transformed into a yes, but. <laughs> I, should have, I should have done a Mentimeter poll at the beginning and then at the end, <laughs> if I'd actually influenced anyone one way or the other. No, it was, it was really, really interesting. Thank you ever so much. Um, we're running a little bit over, but I've got a couple of questions from the uh, from our building audience, if that's all right with you. Yep. Uh, so our first question uh, is extrapolating from the number of exoplanets that we know about. Uh, presumably the statistic for life existing somewhere else must have increased dramatically from 25 years ago when we knew about no others. Is that true? Uh, it's, a, it's a really good question. I guess... Um... In some sense, not having information makes it very easy to, to predict that there's, you, you could either come up and say there was zero <laughs> or you could be incredibly optimistic because there was no constraints. Um, and I guess, you know, 25 years ago, I was, a, I was an optimist and, you know, indeed, in, that's partly why I went to the University of British Columbia to do my PhD was the technique at the time to discover planets, radio precision radio velocities. It was invented at University of British Columbia. Um, and that's why I went there was to do that. Then I saw the work wasn't quite as exciting as I thought it was going to be. It was a lot more mathematical and <laughs> working through noise. Um, but at the time, I was incredibly optimistic. You know, I, I thought life, life's going to be out there everywhere. It's got to be. It's got to be. So, but I think that's partly because there were no constraints. Now that we have some constraints, I guess I've... I've become more pe pessimistic, maybe cautious, maybe is the right the, the right way to put it. Um, so I think I think the next you know ten to twenty years, we will fine tune the statistics. We'll have a better handle of how many star you know how many stars have got Earth like planets that not butted up against them, but you know in, in a maybe a more favorable habitable zone, not not quite butted up against it. I mean, we'll fine tune those numbers, and that will be great. Um, What's going to take, you know, to convince me, um, it's probably going to be something like someone will over the next 10, 20, 30 years, maybe not my lifetime, but in the, you know, the lifetime of the next generation, someone will discover, you know, evidence for 
plant life on, on another planet. And it may be through detecting something in the atmosphere, you know, as a star transit, in, a planet transit in front of a star and you take a spectrum through the, through the atmosphere, or maybe by looking, you know, taking images of planets year in and year out and you see foliage or, you know, you see the reflectivity changing in a way that would be consistent with seasons in some sense. I, I think that's the sort of thing that would convince me if, the, you know, if you can find plant life, which isn't, you know, quite the same thing as we're talking about here. Um, I, I think if you can discover that in the next 10, 20 years, then I would be way more optimistic. I don't think fine tuning the statistics of discovering exoplanets is going to convince me one way or the other, but I think that there is a real possibility that we'll discover, discover plant life through one of these clever techniques. That'll convince me for sure. Fantastic. Uh, and our final question is, wouldn't our solar system to be quite hard to detect using our methods? And the easiest are like hot Jupiters where a very large planet is very close to the star. Um, Doesn't uh, that mean there's lots like us? So I think that is that is the trick. And all. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, Kepler has discovered what, you know, like I said, I, I didn't look it up beforehand, but let's say there's 5,000 planets that are out there. And there have been an enormous number of papers that have been published over the last five, 10 years that have attempted to extrapolate, you know, first, you know, from the first few hundred planets that were discovered to the, the first thousand, 2000, 3000, but you're absolutely right. You, you have a, an observational bias, you know, small planets that take years to go around are the, and you, and you're looking for the transit, you, you know, you have to monitor for years and years to see, to see these sorts of transits. And they're, they're tricky to, to pick out, you know, anything that's really big and blocks some fraction mm -hmm. of its star as it goes across it, obviously is easy to pick out. So your, you know, the selection function, the observational bias is, is built in there. And so, yes, you're absolutely more likely to pick up big things that are close, which is certainly why a disproportionate fraction of them are these hot Jupiters that are whizzing around really close to their stars. So, you know, there, there are clever people who are trolling through the statistics, trying to make realistic extrapolations. Um, and again, there was a, I think it's Bryson et al in the last couple of weeks that put out a, a really nice paper who really looked at this in, in careful detail. Their extrapolations are more optimistic and they're more or less consistent. The numbers that I quoted there in my summary slide are really consistent with the, the newest analysis, but there is a leap of faith in the way they extrapolate from very small numbers of habitable zone, Earth-like-ish planets into how many might be, be out there. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty confident they've done a great job and there probably are lots of habitable zone planets out there. It's whether you meet the criteria of all these other special things that have led the development on, of life here on Earth that come to fruition. Fantastic. And just really quickly before I let you go, out of 10, how would you rate the possibility of there being a bunch of extremophile piano, like penguin badgers living on Venus, which are emitting <laughs> phosphine into the atmosphere? Just out of 10, what would you give that as a rating? <laughs> um, probably go with a small number. But <laughs> the thing that I find really interesting is there may be extra, well, there, there could be extraterrestrial life right now in the sense that on the surface of the moon, you know, last year, the Israeli Space Agency sent a, a mission to, to the moon, a, a lander, and it was carrying, um, I'm sure they violated health and safety regulations by not filling out an appropriate risk assessment, but, you know, they took these, they've got some CDs, and between the layers of the CDs, they put a, a bunch of these, um, uh, I forget what they call the, mm. these, not extremophiles, the... Oh, Yes, yes, the tardigrade. Don't even do a blank thing. Tardigrade, you. yeah, the water yeah. bears. Yeah, tardigrade. Yeah. So there's all these tardigrades there. And these things are incredible. They're the most amazing things on Earth. You know, you can stick them outside the space station for a couple of weeks and they survive. You know, they curl up and do a crinkly little ball. You bring them inside, they rehydrate. These things are incredible. And of course, this mission crash landed on the moon in hibernation stage. So who knows? You know, for the last year, these things could be just hibernating. So, you know, we have maybe, you know, pollinated a you know, an extraterrestrial civilization with these tardigrades that are sitting in hibernation, just waiting on the moon. So they're probably not still alive, but um, we've done our best, whether we like it or not, to actually create extraterrestrial life by seeding it there on the moon. Good to know sci-fi is not that far-fetched. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brad, thank you so, so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. No worries. Thanks, John. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, so uh, last but no, by no means least, we have another fantastic speaker, uh, last of the night, uh, which is Anna Hughes. 
and Anna is a PhD candidate at the University of British Columbia. She studies the radio emission of late type M dwarfs and brown dwarfs in search of, I'm going to pronounce this really badly, so Anna, I apologize, uh, gyrosynchrotron radiation, you can correct me, um, <laughs> when she isn't working, you can find her snowboarding, whether it's cold or hiking when it's warm. Uh, so Anna, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I'm sorry we're running a bit over tonight, so thank you so much for hanging on. Um, I'll pass over to you if that's okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Just going to share my screen real quick. Here we go. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, that's great. We can see that, Anna. Perfect. Okay, so I want to thank Brad for that talk because um, that was a good segue into my research into the space weather of ultra cool dwarfs. So he briefly mentioned that planets that are in orbit around these low mass stars might not be the best place to look for life. And I'm really gonna dig into why. So my research is on the space weather of ultra cool dwarfs, which you might know what all of those words mean individually, but I'm guessing you haven't heard them in this order before. And I'm imagining you're picturing something like this. And while this would be incredibly awesome, this is tragically not what I study, but hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have kind of an idea of what ultra cool dwarfs are, what kind of space weather they're producing and why that's interesting and important to me at least. So I'll start out by defining ultra cool dwarfs, but to get there, we need to understand how stars are classified. So this right here is the Hertzsprung-Russell or HR diagram, which is how astronomers classify stars. So we categorize stars according to their color, which corresponds to their temperature and their luminosity. So up in the top left, we have these very bright and very hot stars. And then down in the bottom right, we have these very cool and very faint stars along this thing called the main sequence, which is essentially when stars are in the prime of their life. Now to make this easier on ourselves, we use letters to categorize them. So the largest stars are O stars, down to the middle stars that are G stars, and we have the sun in that region, and then to the smallest stars that are M stars down at the bottom here. So their mass is related. So the larger a star is, the more internal gravity it has pushing on its core, which is fueling fusion reactions, which is causing it to release a lot of bright emission and live a very short life, as was mentioned earlier. And when stars are very small, so these very faint stars, um, they don't have a lot of internal pressure, so they're not fusing hydrogen as quickly, which allows them to live very long lives, but they're not very bright because they're not releasing a lot of, um, of, lot of light and they're very low temperature. Now to put these masses into something kind of familiar, if the largest stars are elephants, then that makes stars like our sun, St. Bernard's, the kind of medium, and then the smallest stars are little tiny corgis. And it's the corgis that I am the most interested in. So if we go back to the um, lettering categorization, these small stars are called M dwarfs, or little corgis. M dwarfs are very, very common. So about 75% of stars in the solar neighborhood are M dwarfs. They're the majority of stars in the Milky Way. Now their mass again is about half to less than a 10th the mass of the sun. So think St. Bernard, the sun, corgi is M dwarf. Again, because they're so low mass, it takes them trillions of years to burn through their fuel and eventually die. Which means that actually none of them have died yet because the universe isn't old enough for that to have happened. They're also frequent host of rocky planets in the habitable zone, which we learned a little bit about earlier. It's just the region where a planet would be the right temperature to support liquid water, which we think is essential for the development of life. Now, ultra cool dwarfs are these kind of special case of M dwarfs. So they're the very smallest M dwarfs and something called brown dwarfs that are the sort of intermediate object in between being a planet and being a star. So if you notice my little oval extends off of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram and that's because brown dwarfs aren't technically stars so they're not really on there but they're still under the umbrella of ultra cool dwarfs. Now ultra cool dwarfs are particularly interesting because their internal structure is significantly different from that of larger stars like the sun that we're more familiar with. And because of this and a couple other observational region, reasons, we thought that magnetic activity from these stars would be really unlikely, it would be just very faint. But it turns out that actually they do have quite a bit of magnetic activity. 
which as we'll learn isn't great news for planets in orbit around them. So this comes to the first term in my talk title, space weather. Space weather is the environment created around a star that can impact the planets around it. Now I have asterisks after star and planets because space weather doesn't always refer, refer to the environment created by a star and it's not always about the planets. So please don't well actually me on this, but usually that's what people are talking about when we do talk about space weather and that's what I mean in the context of this talk. So we've got an example of some space weather here. This is a solar flare captured by NASA's uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory. Great instance of space weather. If you're a planet that was really close to the sun, you would be bombarded with damaging radiation from the solar flare. You would not be in for a good time. We think this kind of radiation is very damaging to atmospheres and can maybe strip them away altogether if exposed to them for enough time. And the reason that the Earth is fine partially is because our sun is quite chill compared to M dwarfs, chill meaning calm, not chill meaning cold, and also because, as was mentioned earlier, the habitable zone is further away. So for the hottest stars, the habitable zone is very far away from the star because if you're too close, all your water is going to get boiled off. For the sun, it's in this intermediary region, as you can see in the middle here, and for the coolest stars, M dwarfs and even ultra cool dwarfs, the habitable zone is really, really close into the star which means that these planets are extra vulnerable to the star's behavior. So it's very important to know what the star is doing. Now, a good example is our nearest neighbor to our sun, Proxima Centauri, is a late type M dwarf. And Proxima Centauri also has a planet around it, Proxima b, that orbits within its habitable zone. So you would think maybe a good candidate for, for life, but mm, not so much. We've seen with radio telescopes that Proxima Centauri had a super flare, so a flare that was 10 times stronger than the strongest flare from our sun. So to put that into perspective, Proxima b is orbiting within Proxima Centauri's habitable zone, and Proxima Centauri is very cold, so that habitable zone is very close to the star. Proxima b orbits its star 20 times closer than the Earth orbits the sun, a flare that is 10 times larger than a major solar flare would blast the planet Proxima b with 4,000 times more radiation than the Earth receives from solar flares. So sure, technically, it's in the habitable zone. Yeah, written down, maybe a good candidate for life, but the star's behavior pretty much rules that out. So that inspired me that when we're talking about the conditions for supporting life on a planet around the star, it's incredibly important to look at what the star itself is doing. Now this is an image of the sun in visible wavelengths and you can see some magnetic activity. So there's these three little star spots on the top. But what's interesting is when you look at a different portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, so this is a different image of the sun at a different time that is created from a radio telescope, you look at different processes. So radio telescopes are especially good at probing violent magnetic activity from stars. And I find that particularly interesting when I'm looking for violent magnetic activity from ultra-cool dwarfs. So radio telescopes, like the VLA here, show us the telltale signs of violent space weather. Now the two that I use in my research are the Very Large Array, as astronomers have creatively named it, the VLA in New Mexico, and the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or ALMA, which is down in Chile. And I've looked at quite a few stars with these telescopes, but one of them is my absolute favorite, and that's TRAPPIST-1. So you might be familiar with TRAPPIST-1. It gained notoriety a few years ago because it was discovered to have a system of seven Earth-like planets. And by Earth-like, I just mean the size of Earth, three and maybe more of which could orbit within its habitable zone. So pretty exciting discovery. However, TRAPPIST-1 is an ultra-cool dwarf, so it's really important to know what the star's magnetic activity is like in order to say something about the stability of the planet's atmospheres that are around TRAPPIST-1. So just to get an idea of how vulnerable these planets are to the star's behavior, we see the two systems, the TRAPPIST-1 system up top here and our solar system, just the inner planets on the bottom, 
Now, if you were to take the TRAPPIST-1 system and if you were to put it into our solar system, it would be this tiny little blue disk that's well within the orbit of Mercury. So these, star, these planets are just extremely tightly packed into their star. Really important to know if TRAPPIST-1 is exhibiting violent space weather. And to do this, I used radio telescopes. So this is TRAPPIST-1 seen with the K2 um, extended Kepler telescope. And that's just showing us brightness from the star, but I decided to look at it with radio telescopes, see any signals of violent space weather. And actually some good news. So here are my observations. You might notice um, the exciting result that there's nothing there. And I mean, it's a little bit boring, but it's maybe a really good thing to know that there's no violent space weather that would produce radio emission from this star. So the most violent radio processes are not happening on TRAPPIST-1. Now that doesn't rule out any other magnetic activity. However, radio, um, radio emission does probe the most damaging space weather pro processes. So I can't promise you that the TRAPPIST-1 planets are totally safe. The star is a little bit active, but I can tell you that they're not overtly threatened by the most violent forms of stellar space weather that are traceable by radio observations. Okay, happy to hear questions. Thank you so much, Anna. That was the really, really fascinating uh, third talk that we've had tonight. Um, so I've got a few questions from our audience, uh, if that's okay with you, if you've got time. Yeah. Um, so just sort of following on from, from Dave's talk and Brad's talk as well. So it's, when Dave was talking about using things like biomarkers, uh, which is useful for sort of examining, you know, possible signs of life. Is that the kind of thing that we could be applied to looking at systems in TRAPPIST-1? Is that something that's, that's possible? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so the James Webb Space Telescope in particular is what comes to mind. And TRAPPIST-1, I think, already is probably one of the priority targets for JWST to look for biomarkers. Fantastic. So in terms of that, is that something that, is it's a technique you think is is going to be sort of rolled out more and more and then sort of planets in the habitable zone when you're looking at these kind of planets is that sort of a technique that will be sort of applied as sort of a primary you know a, basically a primary search for life hmm so tentatively yes i think an important thing is going to be we're going to have a lot of candidates that our terrestrial planets in their star's habitable zone, and we're gonna to need to start prioritizing them. So maybe we'll prioritize them by planets that are around stars that are relatively inactive. These are the ones that will start looking for biomarkers first, and then planets that are around stars that are very active, maybe we'll save those for when the telescope has spare time. No worries. And then uh, we've got another question that says, you've shown some observations there and you said that you didn't find anything. How frequently are those observations taken? So, because maybe there was nothing there when you were taking the measurements. So how frequently do you take those observations? Yeah, so yes. these were one-time observations. I was looking for what's called quiescent emission from the star TRAPPIST-1. Um, so quiescent would mean that the star is constantly emitting violent space weather activity. And I didn't see any evidence of that. Um, I also have a 50 hour monitoring campaign where I took the very large array and I stared at TRAPPIST-1 for 50 hours. And through that time, I also did not see any radio activity from the star. That I have doesn't a lot mean, of questions. Yeah, go on, sorry, go on, go on. Uh, that doesn't mean that it that it isn't active, but um, it, it's it's not constantly active, and it seems calm over long periods of time. But that doesn't rule out that it could be at some point emitting these super flares. Yeah, 50 hours sounds like a, that. I'm assuming there were shifts in this 50 hours. Oh, yes. Point. Yeah, so you have to make this whole scheduling plan and the VLA will just email you the data one day. they be like, I took some of it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Anna, thank you so, so much for, for joining us. That was a really, really interesting talk and we really appreciate you bringing your time for us tonight. Thank you very much, Anna. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so we've come to the end of our event tonight. Um, so a huge thank you um, to Dave, Brad and to Anna for joining us at all three talks. Uh, and we've had a, a fantastic evening. We've run way over than we normally do just because we had so many brilliant things to talk about. So thank you to the three of you. And we hope to see you back again at Astronomy Untapped sometime in the future. 
Um, so our next event will be in December. Um, well, we hope to see you all back again. I will tell you that during this, uh, during the event, we had uh, Mark Phillips. If you're watching, you are now our hundredth subscriber. Uh, as we're now, this is our sixth event we've done off tap. We, we now have our hundredth subscriber. So Mark Phillips, if you're there, uh, send us a DM, and we have an innumerate amount of ESA space stuff that gave, they gave us. We've got sitting in a box. So you'll get a space goodie bag in the post if you don't mind sharing your address. So do send us a DM uh, and we'll get that to you. It's all quality stuff. It's good, good ESA. Um, but again, yeah, thank huge thank you to our three speakers and to all the volunteers who help to make the event happen uh, every month. Um, and please do join us again uh, next month uh, and we shall see you then and enjoy your evenings, everybody. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks, folks. It was great.